So for the life of me, I could not find the full interview to Kamala Harris and Tim Walls on CNN. I could not find it like online, right? Everybody knows it would be on CNN on an actual cable or whatever. So I went to the CNN website. I went to go try to play the video and they had like a little sample. You couldn't really play the video all the way through. You had to sign in with your TV cable provider. Nobody watches TV. So I went to my phone. I tried to look it up a little bit there. I didn't look that hard, honestly. I was just like, whatever. So I went to YouTube and when I went to YouTube, I only saw clips. I only saw samples and trailers and previews and stuff like that. And listen, I don't want all y'all to go through all that drama, all that stress, all that frustration. So you know what I did? I put the whole video together so you can watch it without any interruptions. I know, you can thank me later. Well, you can, you can thank me by smashing that subscribe button and uh, I'll just detonate the video. Three, two, one, let's go. Governor Wells, thank you so much for sitting down with me and bringing the bus. The bus tour is well underway here in Georgia. You have less time to make your case to voters than any candidate in modern American history. The voters are really eager to hear what your plans are. If you are elected, what would you do on day one in the White House? Well, there are a number of things. I will tell you first and foremost, one of my highest priorities is to do what we can to support and strengthen the middle class. Um, when I look at the aspirations, the goals, the ambitions of the American people, I think that um, people are ready for a new way forward um, in a way that generations of Americans have been fueled by, by hope and by optimism. I think sadly, in the last decade, um, we have had in the former president someone who has really been pushing an agenda and an environment that is about diminishing um, the character and the strength of who we are as Americans, uh, really dividing our nation. And I think people are ready to turn the page on that. So what would you do day one? Day one, it's going to be about, one, implementing my plan for what I call an opportunity economy. I've already laid out a number of um, proposals in that regard, which include what we're going to do to bring down um, the cost of everyday goods, what we're going to do to invest in America's small businesses, what we're going to do to invest in families, for example, extending the child tax credit to $6,000 for families for the first year of their child's life to help them buy a car seat, to help them buy baby clothes, a crib. Um, there's the work that we're going to do that is about investing in the American family around affordable housing, a big issue in our country right now. So there are a number of things on day one. What about you? Well, I'm excited about this agenda, too. As I said, the idea of uh, inspiring America to what can be. And I think many of these things that the vice president's proposing are, are, uh, are things that we share in values. And the child tax credit is one we know that reduces childhood poverty by a third. We did it in Minnesota to have a federal partner in this. Um, unbelievable, I think, in the impact that we can make. You talked about, you call it the opportunity uh, economy. Yeah. It, you are well aware that right now many Americans are struggling. There's yeah. a crisis of affordability. Yeah. One of your campaign themes is we're not going back. But I wonder what you say to voters who do want to go back when it comes to the economy specifically, because their groceries were less expensive, housing was more affordable when Donald Trump was president. Well, let's start with the fact that when Joe Biden and I came in office, it, during the height of a pandemic, we saw over 10 million jobs were lost. Uh, people, I, I mean, literally, we were all tracking the numbers. Hundreds of people a day were dying because of COVID. Um, the economy had crashed. Uh, in large part, all of that because of mismanagement by Donald Trump of that crisis. When we came in, our highest priority was to do what we could to rescue America. And today, we know that we have inflation at under 3%. A lot of our policies have led to the reality that America recovered faster than any wealthy nation around the world. But you are right. Prices, in particular for groceries, are still too high. The American people know it, I know it. 
which is why my agenda includes what we need to do to bring down the price of groceries. For example, dealing with an issue like price gouging, what we need to do to extend the child tax credit to help young families be able to take care of their children in their most formative years, what we need to do to bring down the cost of housing. My proposal includes what would be a tax credit of $25,000 for first-time home buyers, so they can just have enough to put a down payment on a home, which is part of the American dream and their aspiration, but do it in a way that allows them, them to actually get on the path to achieving that goal and that dream. So you have been vice president for three and a half years. Yeah. The steps that you're talking about now, why haven't you done them already? Well, first of all, we had to recover as an economy, and we have done that. I'm very proud of the work that we have done that has brought inflation down to less than 3 percent. The work that we have done to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors. Donald Trump said he was going to do a number of things, including allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Never happened. We did it. So now, in I, as I travel in the state of Georgia and around our country, the number of seniors that have benefited. I've met, I was in Nevada recently, a, a, a grandmother who showed me her receipts. And before we capped the cost of insulin for seniors at $35 a month, she was paying hundreds of dollars, up to thousands of dollars a month for her insulin. She's not doing that so anymore. You maintain Bidenomics is a success. I maintain that when we do the work of bringing down prescription medication for the American people, including capping the cost of the annual cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000, when we do what we did in the first year of being in office to extend the child tax credit so that we cut child poverty in America by over 50 percent, when we do what we have done to invest in the American people in bringing manufacturing back to the United States so that we created over 800,000 new manufacturing jobs, bringing business back to America, what we have done to improve the supply chain so we're not relying on foreign governments to supply American families with their basic needs, I'll say that that's good work. There's more to do, but that's good work. I want to get some clarity on where you stand on some key policy issues. Uh, energy is a big one. When you were in Congress, you supported the Green New Deal. And in 2019, you said, quote, there is no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. Fracking, as you know, is a pretty big issue, sure. particularly in your must-win state of Pennsylvania. Sure. Do you still want to ban fracking? No, and I made that clear on the debate stage in 2020, that I would not ban fracking. As vice president, I did not ban fracking. As president, I will not ban fracking. In 2019, I believe, uh, at a town hall, you said you were asked, would you commit to implementing a federal ban on fracking on your first day in office? And you said, there's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. So yes. So it changed in, the, in that campaign? In 2020, I made very clear where I stand. We are in 2024, and I've not changed that position, nor will I going forward. I kept my word, and I will keep my word. What made you change that position at the time? Well, let's be clear. My values have not changed. I believe it is very important that we take seriously what we must do to guard against what is a clear crisis in terms of the climate. And to do that, we can do what we have accomplished thus far, the Inflation Reduction Act. What we have done to invest, by my calculation, over t probably a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, investing in a clean energy economy. What we've already done, creating over 300,000 new clean energy jobs. That tells me, from my experience as vice president, we can do it without banning fracking. In fact, Dana, Dana, excuse me, um, I cast the tie-breaking vote that actually increased leases for fracking yeah. as vice president. So I'm very clear about where I stand. And was there some policy uh, or scientific data that you saw that you said, oh, okay, I get it now? What I have seen is that we can, we can grow and we can increase a thriving clean energy economy without banning fracking. Okay. Um, another issue, big one, is immigration. Mm -hmm. As vice president, you were tasked with addressing the root causes of migration uh, in southern countries and northern part of Central America. The northern part of, of, yeah. of, uh, of Central America that deals with, that affects the southern border of the U.S. Mm -hmm. During the Biden-Harris administration, there were record numbers of illegal border crossings. Why did the Biden-Harris administration wait three and a half years to implement sweeping asylum restrictions? 
Well, first of all, uh, the root causes work that I did as vice president that I was asked to do by the president has actually resulted in a number of benefits, including historic investments by American businesses in that region. Um, the number of uh, immigrants coming from that region has actually reduced um, since we began that work. But I will say this, that Joe Biden and I and our administration worked with members of the United States Congress on an immigration uh, issue that is very significant to the American people and to our security, which is the border. Mm -hmm. And through bipartisan work, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress, a bill was crafted, which we supported, which I support. And Donald Trump got word of this bill that would have contributed to securing our border. And because he believes that it would not have helped him politically, he told his folks in Congress, don't put it forward. He killed the bill a border security bill that would have put 1,500 more agents on the border. And let me tell you something, the Border Patrol endorsed the bill. And I'm, sure, and I'm sure in large part because they knew they were working around the clock and 1,500 more agents would help them. That bill would have allowed us to increase seizures of fentanyl. Ask any community in America that has been devastated by fentanyl what passing that bill would have done to address their concern and a pain that they've so you experienced. Would, so you would push that legislation again. I just want Not to ask about- Not only push it, I will make sure that it comes to my desk and I would sign it. Just one other question about uh, something that you said in 2019 when you first ran. There was a debate, you raised your hand when asked whether or not uh, the border should be decriminalized. Do you still believe that? I believe there should be consequence. We have laws that have to be followed and enforced, that address and deal with people who cross our border illegally, and there should be consequence. And let's be clear, in this race, I'm the only person who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations who traffic in guns, drugs, and human beings. I'm the only person in this race who actually served a border state as attorney general to enforce our laws. And I would enforce our laws as president going forward. I recognize the problem. Generally speaking, how should voters look at some of the changes that you've made, uh, that you've explained some of here uh, in your policy? Is it because you have more experience now and you've learned more about the information? Is it because you were running for president in a democratic primary? And should they feel comfortable and confident that what you're saying now is going to be your policy moving forward? Dan, I think the, the, the most important and most significant aspect of my policy perspective and decisions is my values have not changed. You mentioned the Green New Deal. I have always believed, and I have worked on it, that the climate crisis is real, that it is an urgent matter, to which we should apply metrics that include holding ourselves to deadlines around time. We did that with the Inflation Reduction Act. We have set goals for the United States of America and by extension the globe around when we should meet certain standards for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as an example. That value has not changed. My value around what we need to do to secure our border, that value has not changed. I spent two terms as the Attorney General of California prosecuting transnational criminal organizations, violations of American laws regarding the passage, illegal passage of guns, drugs, and human beings across our border. My values have not changed. So that is the reality of it. And four years of being vice president, I'll tell you one of the, the, the aspects to your point is traveling the country extensively. I mean, I'm here in Georgia, I think somebody told me 17 times since I've been vice president in Georgia alone. I believe it is important to build consensus, and it is important to, to, to find a common place of understanding of where we can actually solve problems. On that note, you had a lot of Republican speakers at the convention. Yeah. Will you appoint a Republican to your cabinet? Yes, I would. Anyone yes, in mind? I would. No, no one in particular in mind. I got a, we got 68 days to go with this election, so I'm not putting the cart before the horse, but I would. I think, I think it's really important. I. I have spent my career inviting diversity of opinion. I think it's important to have people at the table when some of the most important decisions are being made that have 
different views, different experiences. And I think um, it would be to the benefit of the American public to have a member of my cabinet who was a Republican. I want to ask you about your opponent, Donald Trump. Okay. Um, I was a little bit surprised. People might be surprised to hear that you have never interacted with him, met him face to face. Mm -hmm. That's going to change soon. But what I want to ask you about is what he said last month. He suggested that you happened to turn black recently for political purposes, mm -hmm. questioning a core part of your identity. Yeah. Any same old tired playbook. Next question, please. No. <laughs> That's it? That's it. OK. Um, let's talk about some foreign policy uh, issues that would be on your plate if you become commander in chief. Uh, President Biden has tried unsuccessfully uh, to end the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. He's been doing it for months and months, along with you. Would you do anything differently? For example, would you withhold some U.S. weapons shipments to Israel? That's what a lot of people on the progressive left want you to do. Uh, let me be very clear. I am unequivocal and, and unwavering in my commitment to Israel's defense and its ability to defend itself. And that's not going to change. But let's take a step back. October 7, 1,200 people were massacred. Many young people who were simply attending a music festival. Women were horribly raped. As I said then, I say today, Israel had a right, has a right to defend itself, we would. And how it does so matters. Far too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. And we have got to get a deal done. We, we were in Doha. Mm -hmm. We have to get a deal done. This war must end. In the meantime. And we must get a deal that is about getting the hostages out I've met with the families of the American hostages. Let's get the hostages out. Let's get the ceasefire done. But no change in policy in terms of arms and, and so forth. No, I, we have to get a deal done. Dan, Dana, we have to get a deal done. When you look at the significance of this to the families, to the people who are living in that region, um, it, a deal is not only the right thing to do to end this war, but will unlock so much of what must happen next. I remain committed since I've been on October 8 to what we must do to work toward a two-state solution, where Israel is secure and in equal measure, the Palestinians have security and self-determination and, and dignity. Governor Walsh, the uh, country is just starting to get to know you. I want to ask uh, you a question about how you've described your service in the National Guard. Mm. Uh, you said that you carried weapons in war, but you have never deployed, actually, in a war zone. A campaign official said that you misspoke. Did you? Well, first of all, I'm incredibly proud. I've done 24 years of wearing the uniform of this country. Equally proud of my service in a public school classroom, whether it's Congress or, uh, or the governor. Uh, my record speaks for itself, but I think uh, people are coming to get to know me. I, I speak like they do. Um, I speak candidly. I wear my emotions on my sleeves, and uh, I speak uh, especially passionately about uh, about our children being shot in schools and around around guns. So uh, I think people know me. They know who I am. They know where uh, where my heart is. And again, my record has been out there for over 40 years to, to speak for itself. And the the idea that you said that you were in war, yeah. did you misspeak as the campaign has said? Yeah, I said we were talking about in this case, this was after a school shooting, the ideas of carrying these weapons of war. And uh, my wife, the English teacher, told me my grammar is not always correct. But again, if it's not this, it's an attack on my children for showing love for me or it's an attack on my dog. Uh, I'm not going to do that. And the one thing I'll never do is I'll never demean another member's service in any way. I never have. Uh, and I never will. I just one other question because again, this is all new. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this was not however many days ago. This was not uh, yeah. on either of your bingo cards, especially yours. Um, you had to clarify uh, that you had said that you and your wife w used IVF, but it turned out you used a different kind of fertility in order to uh, have children. And then when you ran for Congress in 2006, your campaign repeatedly made false statements about a 1995 arrest for drunk and reckless driving. What do you say to voters who aren't sure whether they can take you at your word? 
Well, I've been very public. I think they can see uh, my students come out, uh, former folks I've served with, and, and they do, they vouch for me. I certainly own my mistakes when I make them. The one thing I'll tell you is of, um, I wished in this country wouldn't have to do this. I spoke about our infertility issues because it's hell and families know this. And uh, I, I spoke about the treatments that were available to us that, that had those beautiful children there. Um, that's quite a contrast in folks that are trying to, uh, to take those rights away from us. And so uh, I, uh, I think people know who I am. They know that record. They've seen that. I've taught thousands of students. I've been out there. And um, I, I won't apologize for speaking passionately, whether it's guns in schools or protecting of reproductive rights. Uh, the contrast could not be clear between what we're running against. The vice president's position on this has been clear. And um, I think most Americans get it if you've been through that. Um, I don't think they're cutting hairs on IVF or IUI. I think what they're cutting hairs on is an abortion ban and the ability to be able to deny families the chance to have a beautiful child. Vice President Harris, you were a very staunch defender of President Biden's capacity to serve another four years. Right after the debate, you insisted that President Biden is extraordinarily strong. Given where we are now, do you have any regrets about what you told the American people? No, not at all. Not at all. I have um, served with President Biden um, for almost four years now, and I'll tell you, it's one of the greatest honors of my career, truly. Um, he cares so deeply about the American people. He is so smart and, um, and loyal to the American people. And I have spent hours upon hours with him, be it in the Oval Office or the Situation Room. He has the intelligence, the commitment, and the judgment um, and disposition that I think the American people rightly deserve in their president. By contrast, the former president has none of that. And so, um, one, I, I, I am so proud to have served as vice president to Joe Biden. And two, I am so proud to be running with Tim Walls for president of the United States and to bring America what I believe the American people deserve, which is a new way forward and turn the page on the last decade of what I believe has been um, contrary to where the spirit of our country really lies. But the last decade, of course, the last three and a half years has been part of your administration. I'm talking about an era that started about a decade ago where there is some suggestion, warped, I believe it to be, that the measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down instead of where I believe most Americans are which is to believe that the true measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you lift up. That's what's at stake as much as any other detail that we could discuss in this election. Um, because we haven't had a chance to, to talk, I'm just curious, staying on President Biden, when he called you and said he was pulling out of the race, mm -hmm. what was that like? And did he offer to endorse you right away or did you ask for it? It was, um, it was a Sunday, so here, I'll, I'll give you a little too much information. Go for it. <laughs> There's no such thing, Madam Vice President. Um, my family was staying with us, and um, including my baby nieces. And we had just had pancakes and, you know, Auntie, can I have more bacon? Yes, I'll make you more bacon. And then we were going to sit, we were sitting down to, to do a puzzle. <laughs> and the phone rang, and it was Joe Biden. And, um, and he told me what he had decided to do. And um, I asked him, are you sure? And he said, yes. And, um, and that's how I learned about it. And what about the endorsement? Did you ask for it? And he was very clear that he was going to support me. So when he called to tell you, he said, I'm pulling out of the race and I'm going to support you. Well, my first thought was not about me, to be honest with you. My first thought was about him, to be honest. Um, I think history is going to show a number of things about Joe Biden's presidency. I think history is going to show that in so many ways it was transformative, be it on what we have accomplished around finally investing in America's infrastructure, investing in new economies, in new industries, 
what we have done to bring our allies back together and have confidence in who we are as America and grow that alliance, what we have done to stand true to our principles, um, including the, the, one of the most important international rules and norms, which is the importance of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And I think history is going to show not only has Joe Biden led an administration that has achieved those extraordinary successes, but the character of the man is one that he has been in his life and career, including as a president, quite selfless and puts the American people first. I just have to ask you both about two standout moments, aside, of course, from the addresses that you uh, both gave, but standout moments that were perhaps unexpected during the convention. You mentioned one of them, Governor. Uh, a moment that you shared, that the world shared with your son, Gus. You were speaking, the camera caught him, so incredibly proud of you, so emotional, saying, that's my dad. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know as a father I could have ever imagined that. I, I'm grateful for so many reasons to be on this ticket, but that moment, um, to understand what was really important, to, to have my son uh, feel a sense of pride in me, that I was trying to do the right thing. and. Uh, it was, um, you know, you try and protect your kids, you know, it brings, it brings notoriety and things, but it was just such a, uh, a visceral, emotional moment that I'm, I'm just, I'm grateful I got to experience it, and I'm, uh, I'm so proud of him. I'm proud of him, I'm proud of Hope, I'm proud of Gwen. She's a wonderful mother, and these are great kids, and I think the one thing is talking about the era we're in is our, our politics can be better, it can be different, we can, we can show some of these things and we can have families involved in this. And I, I hope that there was a, I hope people felt that out there and I hope they hug their kids a little tighter because you just never know and life can be kind of hard. And, and last question, uh, Madam Vice President, the photograph that has gone viral. Mm. You were speaking, one of your grandnieces that you were just yes. talking about was watching you accept the nomination. Mm -hmm. You didn't explicitly talk about gender or race in your speech but it obviously means a lot to a lot of people, and that yeah. viral picture really says it. What does it mean to you? You know, I, listen, I am running because I believe that I am the best person to do this job at this moment um, for all Americans, regardless of race and gender. Um, but I did see that photograph, and I was deeply touched by it. And you're right, she's, it's the back of her head, her two little braids, and, um, and then I'm in the front of the photograph, obviously speaking. And um, it's very humbling. It's very humbling in many ways. Did she talk to you about it afterwards? Oh, she had a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> she had a lot. She listened to everything, and she listens to everything. Give you your hot takes? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh-huh. Madam Vice President, Governor Walls, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate thank you. it. Thanks thank for you. Having thank us. you, Dana. Thank you.